Um, my name's Sam, if we haven't met, um, and it's my privilege to get to preach God's Word this morning on this Easter Sunday, but a special, before we get there, exciting announcement, Josh and Laura got engaged yesterday. Isn't that good? <laughs> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Let me pray, and we'll get into the passage. Heavenly Father, um, how dependent we are in this moment on you through your spirit, um, in both the preaching and the hearing of your word. And so I pray for your help now, oh, that we would grasp even a little of the glories that are held in this passage, that we would scratch the surface of what it means to be united with Christ in both his death and his resurrection. And I pray you would do that for your glory's sake, in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you've read the, um, the Chronicles of Narnia, but the third book is by C.S. Lewis. We're back there again. I've used a few. <laughs> sorry about that, but not sorry. Um, the Horse in and His Boy. There is a scene toward the end of the book where the main character, Shasta, is feeling a bit down and a bit lonely. He's been kind of left by himself and he's in a pitch black darkness and he's, he's tearful. He's been through a lot and he feels very, very low. And he can't, um, but then he notices that Actually, he's not alone, that there's something or someone walking beside him or walking nearby him. Now, spoiler, it's, it's Aslan the lion, right? The creator of Narnia, the true king of Narnia. But it's after a while of this silence with knowing there's something or someone there, he can't take the silence any longer. And Shasta says, who are you? Barely above a whisper. One who has waited long for you to speak, said the thing. Its voice was not loud, but very large and deep. Are you, are you a giant? asked Shasta. You might call me a giant, said the large voice, but I'm not like the creatures you call giants. I can't see you at all, said Shasta, after staring very hard then, for an even more terrible idea had come into his head, he said, almost in a scream, you're not, not something dead, are you? Oh, please do go away. What harm have I ever done to you? Oh, I am the unluckiest person in the whole world. And so Aslan says, tell me your sorrows. And it says, so he told how he had never known his real father or mother and had been brought up sternly by the fishermen. And then he told the story of his escape and how they were chased by lions and forced to swim for their lives and all their dangers in Tashban and about the night among the tombs and how the beasts howled at him out of the desert. And he told about the heat and thirst of their desert journey and how they were almost at their goal when another lion chased them and wounded Aravis and also how very long it was since he had anything to eat. I do not call you unfortunate, said the large voice. Well, don't you think it was bad luck to meet so many lions, said Shasta. There was only one lion, said the voice. What on earth do you mean? I've just told you there were at least two lions the first night and there was only one, but he was swift of foot. How do you know? I was the lion. And as Shasta gaped with open mouth and said nothing, the voice continued. I was the lion who forced you to join with Aravis. I was the cat who comforted you among the houses of the dead. I was the lion who drove the jackals from you as you slept. I was the lion who gave the horses the new strength of fear for the last mile so that you might reach King Loon in time. And I was the lion, you do not remember, who pushed the boat in which you lay a child near death so that it came to shore where a man sat, wakeful at midnight, to receive you. Now, what's happening in that moment is that Shasta basically has, he knows a fair bit of his own life story and he's, de he's describing it to, to Aslan. But what Aslan is saying is, yes, you know some of your story, but you don't know the whole story. Right? And actually, if you complete, if I could complete the story, well, that'll actually transform what you apparently know and you're correct about, but, but it will transform the way you think about all 
all of that. In fact, it will take you from thinking, I am the unluckiest person alive, to realize those exact events that made you feel like the unluckiest person alive are actually the events that show you have been cared for, you have been loved and watched over by me. See, it's so important to get the full story, right? And the, getting the full story matters, and it can kind of, but it matters because it can kind of transform what you thought and you knew as part of the story, and it can make it better, like in this version, or it can make it worse. So, for example, if I said to you, hey, do you want to come over for dinner on Friday night? You'd be like, oh, that sounds very lovely. Like, yeah, of course I'd love to go. If I finished the story, actually full picture, I'm cooking, you'd be like, oh, but that's not, that's not as good news as it once was. And so it's Easter Sunday, And Easter Sunday is the full story, if you like, of the Easter weekend. See, a lot of people have Good Friday. To be sure, even unbelievers have a sense of Good Friday in that most people believe that Jesus did die and even died on a cross. And so far as it goes, that's good because that's true. But you don't understand the full story. And the full story is that he rose again. And of course, the unbeliever does not believe that. And so, I mean, you go back to the, the, the people who were living at the exact time and saw Jesus die and they lived in the gap. Well, they knew Good Friday and they had to live in the gap of, well, I know Good Friday, but I don't know the full story yet. There's a clip on YouTube that me and the children watch and we watch it literally every Good Friday. Um, I don't know if you, you probably know it. It's, it's this clip from a sermon by a guy named S.M. Lockridge. SM stands for Shadrach, Meshach, Lockridge. Poor old Abednego just got the shafted. But Shadrach, Meshach, Lockridge, and the clip is called It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And he goes through, and it's quite powerful, and he describes what it was like for all the different, kind, the different groups of people, what it was like on the, on the Friday. And he repeats the phrase, yeah, but they don't know, Sunday's coming. So he says, the, the, for example, the disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denying. The Romans beat my Jesus. They crown him with thorns, but they don't know that Sunday's coming. The world's winning. People are sinning and evil's grinning. The soldiers nail my Savior's hands to the cross. They nail my Savior's feet to the cross, and then they raise him up next to criminals. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. The Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. Hope is lost. Death has won. Sin has conquered. Satan is laughing. Jesus is buried. A soldier stands guard. A rock is rolled into place, but they don't know. It's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is coming. The question this morning is, do you know Sunday? Maybe you know Friday, and that's good as far as it goes. It's an excellent thing to know. But do you know the full story of Easter Sunday? And in this passage, I think Paul is writing to Christians in the, in the church in Rome. And what Paul wants to do, because he's never been to Rome, he wants to make sure that they believe the same gospel as all the churches, that the, the true gospel is understood and believed in all the churches of Jesus Christ. And he wants them specifically in this passage to know both the cross and the resurrection. So he says it a few times. He says, verse 3, he says, do you not know? In verse 6, he begins with, we know, like we Christians, we know Right, verse 9 begins as well. He says, we know, like we know. And so you feel, kind of feel the weight of the question. Well, do we know? Do I know? Do I know both the cross and the resurrection? To be sure, every Christian, at least mentally, if any Christian with any meaningful sense of the term Christian, believes in both the cross and the resurrection. Right? We believe that Jesus died and he rose again. But believing it like mentally and having like cognitive mental assent to those realities is a different thing to where we could potentially deny it functionally in our lives to know the cross, but not know the resurrected life of Christ. We get kind of what's happening on Good Friday, but it's a bit more of a mystery for the, the average Christian at times to understand Resurrection Sunday and how that applies to our lives. And so what would that look like for us to kind of get Good Friday but not really live in light of 
Easter Sunday. Well, our passage tells us exactly what that life would look like, I think. In the very first verse, chapter 6, verse 1, it's the person who asks the question, well, shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? You know, how on earth did we ever, anyone ever end up asking such a question? Shall we go on sinning that grace may abound in response to the gospel? How on earth did it get there? Well, it's because of the, the radical, the scandalous gospel of grace with Nathan preached from the chapter just before Romans chapter 6, chapter 5, believe it or not, and, and, and he preached from that. And what, what did we hear? I mean, the, the radical gospel of grace. It was while you were sinning that Christ died. It was while we were weak, while we were ungodly, Christ died for us. He shows his love for us while we were that. And so the, the, the amazing thing of the gospel is, and the, the way the reformers put it, was that the, the, a person can be both same-time sinner and same-time justified. I can be a sinner and forgiven at the same time. And so chapter 5 closes, the second last verse of chapter 5. Keep your Bibles open. You can just look just above it. Chapter 6. And... Paul closes out the chapter, the second last verse, in what I think is like glorious and extremely dangerous words, where he says, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Glorious. Where sin increases, grace abounds. Well, it's not like a one-for-one -one ratio. Well, there's enough sin. There's, you know, if there's this much sin, well, there's enough grace to kind of cover that. But Paul's like, no, 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 it's not, that's not the picture. Where there's sin increasing, you have grace coming in like an ocean to drown that out. Glorious and dangerous because it leads to the question, okay, if sin increases, grace abounds, shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? Now, there's two ways, I think, of asking that question. I think there's, there's a, an insincere way, which I've always thought about. And I was listening to um, a lecture by Dick Lucas on this, on this passage. And he said, he kind of posited that it's actually a sincere way to ask that question. And so let me just lay it out. An insincere way of asking that question would be the person who's, I mean, not really, kind of really wanting to follow Jesus at all. But it just kind of finds an excuse there. Okay, so the gospel is grace. It's not anything I do. I'm not, you know, more saved, the more obedient I am, so I'll just keep sinning. It doesn't matter. Okay, well, the passage is going to address that. But there's also a sincere way of kind of feeling the weight of that question. It's like, okay, so the gospel seems to be of grace, and then I can be both same-time sinner and same-time justified. Like, that's wonderful. That's, that's excellent. But am I just going to keep sinning and keep being saved? Because I... I would love to not keep sinning. Like, is there any power to actually stop sinning? Or am I stuck in this kind of cycle of sinned but forgiving, sinning and forgiving, like sinning and grace abounding? And maybe we just become, in the end, comfortable with our sin and go, okay, well, that's kind of just who I am then, I guess. This is, and we just become passive about our sin and accepting, well, maybe this is just the way it is. That that's the lot of a Christian. We are both same time sinner and same time justified. Well, this Paul is going to say, no, actually, you're missing a big part of the story. You have some of it, and that's wonderful as far as it goes, but essentially you have Good Friday. But you don't have the resurrection of Sunday. You have Good Friday. Your sin is dealt with. It's forgiven. That's perfect. Like, that's central. That's primary. That's so important. But let me offer you Easter Sunday. You know the cross. Let me tell you about the resurrection. You know the forgiveness of sin in Jesus. But let me tell you about the resurrected life you can have in Christ. And so what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2 answers immediately before we can go any further down that track of thinking. By no means. It's emphatic. Shut that nonsense down straight away. By no means. May it never be. Surely not. One version says, God forbid. So let's hear that right now, even as a church. Shall you go on sinning, Christian? Shall you? By no means. May it never be. God forbid that we would continue sinning. But the question is, well, why? 
Why not? Well, Paul does a kind of politician type move. He says, well, let me answer your question with another question. I don't remember a comedian saying, I would have loved to have known that trick back at school. So, Sam, what is six times seven? <laughs> let me answer your question with another question. And just kind of skirt around that. Why is the sky blue or something, you know? Paul answers the question with another question. Still in verse two, what does he say? How can we who died to sin still live in it? <clears throat> That's why he says no, by no means. Why? How can we who died to sin still live in it? It's a how question, meaning you can't. Now, notice what he's done. He's redefined, <clears throat> pardon me, sorry. He has redefined what the hypothetical questioner describes sin as. So he said, the, the first question was, shall we go on sinning? Now, how does he reinterpret that phrase? Living in it. Living in it. There's a big difference. He's redefined it. See, the first one is more behavioral. Shall we go on sinning? Shall we go on doing the thing that's called sin? Shall we just keep doing that? He's like, no. No. No, actually, what you're describing is living in it. See, that's living in the realm of sin. You don't just go on sinning without living under the power and the authority of sin. He's saying, no, you've died to that. You see, the reality is we sin because we are sinners by nature, living in the realm under the authority, under the power of sin. So when salvation comes and conversion comes, it needs to be forgiveness of sin, but it also needs to be more if sin's not just behaviors, but a realm in which we need to get out of. We need to be not just forgiven, but removed and given new life. So an illustration of that might be this. Um, you imagine a man living in uh, a third world country and he go, gets into a whole heap of terrible, terrible debt. And so he finds himself just ending up living in, a, in squalor, living in a slum, unable to provide for his family because of just the crushing weight of the debt that he finds himself in, unable to feed his family. Now, one day a man comes along who's the one, actually, that this man owes all the money to. And he comes to see him where he lives. And he walks in and he sees him and the man who, who owes him the money is at first obviously quite scared and frightened. Oh, no. Oh, no but it actually goes far better than he could have imagined because it turns out the man he owed money to is a very kind man. And he says to him, actually, I've come to tell you something. You owe me nothing anymore. Nothing. Actually, more than that, I've decided that any debt you get into from now on, it's all paid for. It's all paid for. Wow. The guy in debt is just like, what would he feel? Just, that's amazing. They'd be just rejoicing, wouldn't they? Like that, wow, that is, that is better news than I could have imagined in this moment. But you can imagine as he goes on living, um, he still has no money. And there's no way of making money. And so he lives in the kind of slum and he kind of keeps getting in debt, but he knows that the debt is forgiven. And so that's cleansed and that's really good news. But he keeps getting into debt and he keeps getting into debt because he just kind of lives in this context and he can't, you know, there's no way of making money or kind of getting out of this situation. And you can imagine him looking around after a while and being thankful that his debt is cleared, but thinking, I would love to not live here anymore. I would love to be out of this kind of trap, stuck in this. So rewind and imagine that the story goes a bit differently and, and the, the, the man's in debt and he's in the slum and then the, the, the rich man comes along and says, yeah, you're, same thing still, it's all clear, it's all cleared, you know, and you'll never have to worry about that again. But more than that, I'm taking you out of here. And, and I've, got a, I've got a place for you. I know you love the beach. I'm going to put you right on the beach and your bank account is full and here's work for you to do. You never... You don't even need to go in debt again. I've set you up. Well, the first version is to, I think, only, to only know Good Friday, as far as it goes. But the second is to know Easter Sunday as well. The first is to be forgiven, but to go on sinning that grace may abound. The second is to be forgiven and placed in a whole new realm where you don't have to sin anymore. So Paul asks, how can we who died to sin still live in it? We can't live in something that you, where's, where's death? Died. 
but we have to keep living. So where are we alive that we might live where we are alive? Well, to answer that, Paul's going to show that we have been united with Christ in both his death and his resurrection. And that's going to take us all down the way down to verse 10. And after verse 10, he's going to apply that union with Christ to our lives. So let's, let's, let's get at those verses. So verse 3 to 10, describing our union with Christ, 11 to 14, applying that to our lives. So the first place Paul goes to, to describe our union with Christ in both his life and his resurrection, Good Friday and Easter Sunday, is our baptism. Look with me. Verse 3. Do you not know, he says, that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus? So So all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. He says, well, let's go back. Let's think about your baptism. Now, that makes sense on a number of levels. It might not have been your first thought. Oh, take me to my baptism. Let me think about my baptism. But that makes sense on a number of levels because, at least for one, they're all baptized. Christians are baptized people. Might sound controversial in our day. What do you mean all Christians are baptized? Well, all Christians ought to be baptized, right? Because that is the sign given to the new covenant people of God. It marks out the people of God, the covenant sign of baptism. So Paul can just assume, I'm writing to Christians, they're baptized. So they'll be able to remember this. I'll draw on their baptism. The other reason it's perfect for what he's talking about is because it actually means, the ex- like it's the exact picture of the thing he wants them to know. So notice a few, the few key moments in, that, in those verses. Verse 3 ends with the, the words, baptized into his death. Verse 4 begins, we were buried, therefore with him. And verse 4 includes, just as Christ was raised from the dead. So we have death, burial, resurrection. Christ died, was buried, he rose again. We have Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And we are all included in that, and baptism signifies that, right? So the person, hopefully we've all seen baptism, is the person goes down into the watery grave. Well, there's death, dying with Christ. The person goes down into there. They are immersed in the grave. They are buried. They are underwater. But they don't stay there, right? They come back up. They've risen again, united with Christ. His death, burial, and resurrection. It's not an accident that everyone, everyone survives baptism. It's not an accident. That's, that's, it's, 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 you know, I mean, it's good, obviously, but, but it completes the, the gospel narrative, we don't just die with Christ, we're risen again with Him, and it finishes the story. So when Paul asks, how can we, who have died to sin, go on living in it? And then he describes the baptism, you go, yeah, well, that, that would be like a person who's been baptized, come up, new person, like signifying their, their new reality, and go on, I, I still, I want to live underwater still. Yeah, but you don't live underwater. People die underwater, right? We can't breathe. We don't have gills or anything like that. We, that's where we die. So the, the, the new person doesn't want to go back underwater, nor do they want to go kind of reverse the whole thing and go back under the water and back to the old self. Well, that's what that's like. It's like, shall we go on sinning? No. no how can we who have died to sin, died, just go back and live in it? Well, that's the awesome reality of conversion in a person. Something happens. Oh, I'd love us to recapture the reality, the awesome, powerful reality of conversion. That when someone is converted and they are converted truly, man, something happens. They can't be left unchanged. There is, I think, in our day, too many a Christian who claims the name of Christian And you can wonder to yourself, but where is the reality of conversion? You just seem so casual with regards to Christ, so casual with regards to the gospel, so casual when it comes to the bride of Christ, so casual when it comes to your own holiness. It all just seems like where's conversion? Like this. Verses like these ones um, 
uh, why I, I say each time, if you've been here, when I introduce baptisms, we always describe what baptism means. And I'll encourage everyone who's in the congregation, if you have been baptized, use this opportunity to remember your own baptism. That's not just because it's a nice memory. Yeah, that was a beautiful day. I remember that day. The sun was out. It was just a lovely, lovely day. We had a nice lunch afterwards and all of that. That's not because we remember, that's not why we remember our baptism. Why we remember, why I encourage you, remember your own baptism is because that's who you are. That's your very identity. You are a person who has died with Christ and risen to new life. You are seeing who you are played out in front of you. In an essay called Taking Baptism Seriously, J.I. Packer wrote this. He said, We may affirm that baptism is important and give it a large place in our theology, but we do not think or pray or talk much about it as a defining factor in our Christian identity. Just as wearing a uniform helps members of the armed forces to remember that being in the services now, their first loyalty is to their country and their first task is to obey the orders of their superior officers. So remembering that we have been baptized helps us to keep our Christian commitment before us in sharp focus. Remember your baptism. Uh, Martin Luther would have these big struggles with Satan, the devil, and all his temptations. And, and he said one of the things he would repeat to himself is the Latin phrase, baptizatus sum, meaning I am baptized. And he would draw on it, reminding himself of who he was. And so Paul's doing the same thing to the Roman church and to anyone who would struggle with this temptation, well, shall I go on sinning? He would say, no, you are baptized. You are a baptized person. You have died to living in sin and going on sinning. You are alive now with Christ. Verse 5. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. So He just puts them side by side so you cannot possibly think that, yeah, I have one, but I don't have the other. So no, no, no. They puts them side by side. It's an if-then clause, right? If this is true, well, then this is true. If you have been united with Him in a death like His, we don't have the exact same death, we have, none of us here have been crucified on a cross, but you have died spiritually to the old self, so our death is like His. Well, if that has happened, then, well, notice the phrase He puts in between, we shall certainly, we shall certainly, absolutely, no way around it, be raised with, united with Him in a resurrection like His. That's wonderful, isn't it? No one can say, I have my sin cancelled, but then not go on and to live the resurrected life, transformed life that God has called us to. Another way of saying it is, no one can say that I have Jesus as my Savior, but He is not my Lord. Verse 6, we know, this begs the question again, do you know? Do you know this? We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Do you know? The person at the beginning of the passage said, let's go on sinning. Paul calls that person, the let's go on sinning person, what does he call them in this, in this verse? Our old self. That was our old self. What happened to the old self, he says? That old self was crucified. Just as Christ was crucified, that old self is dead and gone. Crucified with Him. Why? What does he say? In order that we are crucified, the old self is gone, dead, for a purpose. In order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. Our bodies of sin. Like sin just described our bodies. You know, our, our bodies were just under the rule and the reign and this the kind of power authority of sin. My, our eyes looked where they ought not to have looked. Our mouths said the things they ought never to have said. Our legs went where we sh shouldn't go. Our arms were used for violence. Our bodies were a body of sin, right? 
under sin. And what happened to our bodies of sin, he says? Brought to nothing. Gone. Isn't that good news? It's good news. He says, if that's happened, then you're not a slave to it anymore. Now he's writing to the Romans in the Roman Empire. A third of the whole empire are slaves. You're not a slave to that anymore, right? You just imagine a slave working for their master, but the slave dies. Do they keep working for their master? No, they're dead. Can the master go to the corpse and still demand its allegiance? Hey, do this for me. I still own you. No, it's dead. Dead to sin means set free from it. You are so dead. You're like a corpse when it comes to sin. And sin comes along and tries to tempt you. And it's tempting a dead body. It's saying, I own you. It's dead. That's what Paul's saying. Verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. We know, okay, do you know? We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. For the death He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. The emphasis in, those, emphasis in those, that passage is the once-for-all nature of Christ's death and His resurrection. Verse 9 says, Be, being raised from the dead will never die again. Christ will never die again. Verse 10, He died to sin, what? Once for all. Why is that important to Paul's argument right now? Well, he's saying if Christ only died once and rose again once for all, if that has happened for you, it's once for all. It's once for all. It's done. If the old man is dead, he's dead. He ain't coming back. It's a once for all thing. You will sooner, Paul says, put Christ back on the cross again. You will sooner bury the risen Lord right now in the grave than for you to go back again as well. You have been united with Christ in his, his death and resurrection once for all. Man, praise God. Before his conversion, the, the great theologian of the 4th and 5th century, Augustine, um, he was addicted to sex. It's actually the sin that kind of kept him from coming to the Lord for a long time, just addicted to it. And after he became a Christian, um, a prostitute that he formerly once knew recognized him and came up to him and said this, said, hi, why don't you come home with me? He simply replied, no, sorry, and he walked away. And so she turns and calls out to him and says, but Augustine, don't you remember who I am? It's me. And he turned around and said, yes, but it's not me. See, the old self was gone. It's not me. It's not me anymore. And so having described all of that, and they are glorious things, aren't they? Glorious realities. Paul says we've got to practice that in our lives. That has to make an impact. Conversion has to mean something, right? And so then in verse 11, Paul turns to that. Um, to this point, there's been no commands. And as far as I can tell, I, I, I need to check. I'm not sure there's been any commands in Romans so far. So here we are in chapter 6, and it's just been gospel. Here's the truth. Here's the, the realities of the gospel. This has happened. Well, now we've got to respond to it. Verse 11 says, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You see, all of that is true and that is a reality and that is an amazing reality. And now in response to that, you must consider that to be true. Consider it, because it is, consider yourself dead to sin and alive to Christ. Consider yourself that way. Right, he goes on in verse 12 to 14 to say similar things. So we don't have time to get, pull it all apart, but let me read this and let this land on us. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but you are under grace. 
Shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? No, you're not under law, you're under grace. Grace does the exact opposite thing. I know there are so many different situations that we might kind of come to this passage from, different contexts. I know that some of you in this room may feel very much alive to a sin that this passage is saying you are dead to. And you're like, I, I just struggle to believe this is true. Well, there's, there's, there's a couple possible realities to that situation. One is, of course, that you are not yet converted. You are half-heartedly Christian. And you might wish, I mean, I wish I didn't do that anymore. I wish I don't really like that thing about me. But it's still stuck in kind of worldly repentance. It's not godly repentance. It's just worldly sorrow over, over what you're like. And the encouragement this morning would be, come to Jesus Put your faith in him and his death and his resurrection will be for you. But there's another person who might feel like that. And whilst you believe you are under sin's dominion, I'm telling you this morning on the basis of word, God's word, you are not. And you go, but I don't feel like it. I'm, going, I'm just going to trust God's word on this. And it says you absolutely are not. In fact, that old person is dead and gone. And now you need to begin to consider yourself dead to sin and alive to Christ. You must consider yourself as you actually are. You must not go on sinning. Certainly not get comfortable with your sin or be unrepentant of your sin. The Christian does not do that. You must no longer present your members, your instruments, as un for unrighteousness, as Paul says, but for righteousness' sake. You are free. You are free from sin and its power and its dominion. You don't live under that anymore. Now, this passage is not teaching any kind of sinless perfectionism, right? It's not saying that we're going to come to Christ and we're going to live perfectly because sin is gone. Um, else, we wouldn't, Paul wouldn't have to include commands like, come on, consider yourself this way. No, it's because at times we, we fail to consider ourselves that way. And at times we, we kind of, we do things for unrighteousness. And Paul's saying, no, stop doing that. That's not who you are. Do it for righteousness. See, we're not currently saved from all the presence of sin, but we are saved from the power of sin. One day, praise God, we will be delivered from both the presence and the power of sin. But that is not today. As John Stott said, for the Christian, sinning actually becomes, he says, utterly incongruous with who you are think of it like that isn't that good when you sin that is so utterly incongruous it doesn't match with who you are it's just not what God's done in you R.C. Sproul put it like this he said whilst you will sin inevitably you never sin necessarily do you know that I hope you know that whilst we will sin inevitably we do not sin necessarily. And it can be a process to loosen the grip and the authority of sin in our lives. When someone has had someone, you know, and maybe you've experienced this, where someone's been an authority over you for a kind of a long period of time, you might be able to snap out of that when they don't no longer have that authority. Um, but it's, it's, it's often sometimes a process. Like you might snap out of it if you've been like, you know, you just kind of see that in the TV shows sometimes someone like is leaving their workplace and they finally just, I'm out of your authority and I'm going to let everybody have it, you know, and they're just like cussing everybody out on the way out of the room and just burning all the bridges, right? Well, that's, that's one way to do it. That wasn't, you know, the only experience I kind of have of this, I, think, I was thinking about school. You know, you, you, I mean, teachers have this authority over you for a long time. And you're kind of living under that authority, and so it's Mr. and it's Mrs. and all of that, and you're kind of a bit nervous. Maybe it's not you, maybe it's just me. And I was just a bit nervous around teachers. Uh, maybe that was more about me, actually. So, but anyway, um, you run into, you, you leave school, and suddenly, they have no authority over you whatsoever, right? But it's just sometimes hard to like, for that to, to train your brain like that. And so, every now and then, you might run into a teacher, and you're and for me, at least, it was like, oh, man, my shirt's out again. You know, it's just like, uh, I just pull my socks up and, you know, what have you. There's a particular teacher slash um, deputy principal who expressed somewhat frequently his disappointment in me. And um, 
And every, and every so often we're in enough similar circles that I might see him once every couple of years. And I just, I, I just cannot do it. <laughs> I just, I just, because there's authority. I'm, I just assume you're still super disappointed in me. And you probably would be if we chatted again. And I say, so we just got to, I just got to try to avoid that. And, but you know, like when a teacher says to you, you know, after you've left school and you keep saying Mr. and Mrs., you know, and they're like, dude, you can call me Jimmy now, you know. And I'm like, I just don't know if I care. <laughs> like, I don't know, you know, because this, it's kind of like this getting out from, you know, I'm out of the authority, but it still feels like I'm under it. And that can feel a bit like sin, like I, I'm out of it, but along it comes back again and it says, oh, it's me. And it's like, oh, man. And you still feel that it has some authority, some power. And Paul's writing to you saying, shall you go on sinning like that? No. Why? It has no power over you. You're out from underneath that. You've been united to Christ, not only in his death, but his resurrected life. So what would all this look like on the ground? Temptation comes along. It comes along. What do you do? Well, I think there's a there's hundred things you could do. But from this passage, what could you do? Well, you could say to yourself, I am baptized. That's a great place to start. Sin comes along, I am baptized. I died to this sin when Christ died. I have been raised to new life. That's who I am. I'm entirely free right now to not sin. It has no dominion over me. In fact, it it goes directly against, it is incongruous with who I am. Perhaps it's an old sin, and it's an old sin that dates back before your conversion. And it kind of comes back and says, hey, it's me. Well, you can look at that sin and say, yeah, yeah, but it's not me. It's not me. What this passage does, I think, is recapture for us. And I want to like, just build up the reality of conversion in your life. When you were converted, man, something happened. You were transferred from the kingdom of death to the kingdom of life. It's interesting that Paul goes back to our conversion, isn't it? Shall we, to the person, shall we go on sinning? Like, is that, is that my lot? Is that my lot? He doesn't go forward, go, well, here's what you need. You need this kind of experience. Or what you need to do is get to a mountaintop and kind of have that. Or you need, what you need to do is go to this person and see this speaker and, see, and, and get underneath this ministry. He says, just go back. It, it, it's something that every single Christian can, can do. He says, go back to your conversion. Go back to your baptism. Go there. You have everything you need in your conversion. You need everything you need in the realities of your baptism and what it signifies. Go back to the cross and the resurrection. Go back to Good Friday and, of course, Easter Sunday when the old man was crucified and you were made alive. I think we think too little, too often, about the awesome reality of conversion. Um, John Patton, and I'm finishing with this, this illustration. John Patton was a missionary to the New Hebrides, now called Vanuatu. Um, and when he was going there, it was full of cannibals at the time. And people said, John Patton, do not go there. They will eat you. And he's like, well, I'll either die and be eaten by worms or by them. I'm just going to go there, right? And so he went and preached the gospel. And for a long time, not a lot of fruit, but a long Finally, a person who came to be called Abraham became a Christian. And he writes about Abraham in his autobiography. And he writes in his autobiography about the conversion of, of Abraham so that the people back home would realize, who are skeptical of the reality of conversion, that they would realize, oh man, if you could just be here for a second, you would realize conversion is real. People change. They are, turn, they are turned from death to life. They, they, they are not slaves to that anymore. They are slaves to righteousness. And so he writes this, he says, When I have read or heard the shallow objections of irreligious scribblers and talkers hinting that there was no reality in conversions and that mission effort was but waste, oh, how my heart has yearned to plant them just one week on Tanner with the natural man all around in the person of cannibal and heathen, and only the one spiritual man in the person of the converted Abraham, nursing them, feeding them, saving them for the love of Jesus. 
that I might just learn how many hours it took to convince them that Christ in a man was a reality after all. All the skepticism of Europe would hide its head in foolish shame and all its doubts would dissolve under one glance of the new light that Jesus and Jesus alone pours from the converted cannibal's eye. The reality of conversion, the thing that happened, Good Friday and Easter Sunday, no longer slaves to sin, but slaves to righteousness, born again to live for Him. Oh, church, consider yourself dead to sin and alive to Christ. If you are not a Christian here this morning, and this is like, yeah, I get some of the stories, but I don't get the reality of it. This is an open invitation that whosoever would come and believe in Jesus, to put your faith and your trust in His death and resurrection, all of this becomes yours. It is at your very t- fingertips. The riches of Christ, now and forevermore. Let me pray.